this is Wiley Edmonds, and this is Dawn of Destiny. The prophetic end time scenario that we have studied in our Bible throughout our lifetime, leading up to the rapture of the church, is no longer going to happen. It is now happening already, now, today, the future spoken of in the Bible is now. We're living it. We're seeing it every day. The prophecy of the Bible uh, the tells about the end time, the end time scenarios, has already been fulfilled. We are to the point to where the only thing that yet lacks being fulfilled to complete the Bible prophecy leading up to the second coming of Jesus Christ has already been fulfilled and accomplished. We are now waiting only on the second coming of Jesus Christ as he appears in the clouds and these raptured saints go to meet him there. You see, as we look back, and I've spoken of in this special edition just the other day, that the last 100 years has been a, a period of time that uh, is, has been a total determinative period of time. In other words, the finality of getting the world uh, station set, getting all the people of the world, the nations of the world, all lined up ready for the end time book of Revelation to be fulfilled, then that has already been falling in place all during your lifetime. From a hundred years ago in, eight, in 1922, and I misspoke last time and said 1912, 1922, the time of the British mandate, when the Britons who were then in control of the land of Palestine and most of the area in the Middle East following the results of winning the First World War, we understand that that mandate allowed the Jews to be able to go back and form a homeland, a place where they can gather together and claim as their very own. And then in 1948 came the fulfillment of Isaiah, when Isaiah the prophet, talking about this time, the last time, the era of time just preceding the rapture of the church, he talked about Israel and that Israel would be reborn, and that Israel would be again a nation, and that it would be a nation that would be born in a day. And so it was. And all of these things, the Six-Day War in 1967, and then we have other wars that where people have the other nations in the area have jumped on Israel, and Israel has always crushed them with defeat. There's getting to be, going to be another war that's going to happen relatively soon, and we don't know if that war is going to be instigated by the rapture of the church or if the, uh, the rapture of the church is going to instigate that war, one or the other, but it is a war that will happen called the War of Gog and Magog that is going to happen right in the period of time when Jesus lifts his saints out of here because the great tribulation at that point begins and the great tribulation period that seven year period between the time of the rapture of God's children the, the bride of Christ that period of time between there and the second coming of Jesus when he literally comes back with those saints and sets up his righteous kingdom to rule upon this earth, a righteous government with the devil being bound for a thousand years. And that period of time is carried out in the book of Revelation. The entire story of that seven-year tribulation period is found in the Revelation in your Bible, beginning in the fourth chapter in the first verse. It there begins, from that opens the door of what's going on in and the period of time of the Revelation. That is a seven-year period of time encompassed in those last, uh, from the fourth chapter on through the finality of the book of Revelation. Now, as we've been talking about the seven feasts of Israel, and as I've said before, I know most people 
take it and they look at it and it's a whole hum, that's Old Testament. Well, let me tell you something. The New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. The New Testament is revealed in the Old Testament and the Old Testament has concealed the New Testament, but they go together. They're all, it's all God's program. God's program did not begin when Jesus died on the cross at Calvary. God's program began the day that Adam and Eve took a bite of that fruit that had been uh, forbidden by God. And at that period of time, from then forward, God has put together this program, and this program is for the redemption of man to be able to be redeemed back from that. That this uh, world, as God has established and set it up, when I talk about the world, I'm not talking about so much about the earth, but the existence of mankind, our world, has been set up for a period of 7,000 years, a lot of demand. We've talked about it over and over. Over. But from the time of Moses, God instituted a law for the nation of Israel to follow. Now, understand this. The nation of Israel is God's time clock. Understand that. It is God's time clock. If you want to know what period of time it is, as far as God's time is concerned, you need to look no further than the nation of Israel. And the prophecy that has been to mortal man, to natural man, it's impossible. The Jews were without a government. They were without a country. They were without everything having to do with a national... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> the national relationship. I told you I was having a struggle. <coughs> <clears throat> but they having that national, they did not have a national relationship of any kind for 2,500 and at least 35 to 55 years. And then all of a sudden again they have a nation and today they are one of the ten strongest nations on earth. And they have been blessed and God is fulfilling his word through the nation of Israel. And we know by that that it is time because God said in Matthew and in Luke's gospel, Jesus said that the generation that was living when these things begin to come to pass, in other words, these things that are happening, happening now today from the time that Israel became a nation until the second coming of Jesus. And in that, when I talk of the second coming, I'm really referencing the rapture. That's more of a habit that we Christians have gotten into talking about the second coming when a lot of times we're referring to the rapture, not the literal second coming because at the rapture he only appears in the clouds of heaven and it does not come to the earth. So we're talking about these feasts. Now, as I said, people say, well, that, that's so irrelevant. Well, it's not irrelevant because everything that was prophesied through the prophecy of these seven feasts of Israel is relevant to his timepiece, to how that we can know his program for redeeming mankind from his fallen state. We tell people when they come to uh, know the Lord that we you know, tell them you need to be saved, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to live this kind of life, you need to align yourself and fellowship with godly people. That's all true. You know, coming to Jesus as the only form of salvation is absolutely true. But you need to understand the backdrop of this. Jesus coming and dying on the cross at Calvary was fulfilled at the Feast of Passover. Jesus being put into the tomb fulfilled the day of unleavened bread. And then the feast of the first fruits. Jesus Christ, uh, uh, Paul speaking of, uh, of uh, Jesus, he says that he is the first fruits. Uh, since by Adam all men have sinned and all men have died, then even so in Christ being the first fruits of them that shall rise. So Jesus is the first fruits. <clears throat> I wanted to show you something. Now, this is not, I'm not going to go into a, some kind of a medical lecture. But what I want to do is, again, I've talked about this being the backbone of the Bible. I doubt that you've ever heard anyone say that these seven feasts are the backbone of the Bible. But it, I, don't, I think it's undeniable. 
just as the backbone, your backbone in your body runs from your brain right down to your tailbone, which humans don't have a, a tail, scientists, you know, some of them say, well, that's a sign that we, oh, you know, forget it. Uh, means nothing. Uh, but this backbone has a hollowed out place right down through it that forms a tube. And this tube that runs from your brain all the way down to the very bottom of your backbone, as I said, your tailbone, as we call it, that every nerve in your body runs through that. And that's why that when people have uh, injuries that affect them to where like a bone is broken in their back and it crushes that spine, they become paralyzed from that point down. Well, what happens is every nerve in your body, even here's your hearing, your eyesight, uh, your uh, the thyroid gland, all these glands, all these organs of your body, even extending out to your muscles, your skeletal muscles that help you to move or allow you to move, uh, all the way down to your fingertips and your toes, all of your extremities, every one of them are controlled by these nerves that come through that and out of that backbone into these various places. Now, that's exactly the way that the uh, seven feasts of Israel that God designed them so that every portion of his program, every portion of his plan from the time of Moses until the redemption of man over in the last chapter of the book of Revelation where that this earthly kingdom is turned over to God as we enter into the eternities that every one of those are nerves that flows out of that backbone into all of these varying prophecies. Every single solitary prophecy of your Bible, it just like every single portion of your body, every organ in your body is controlled by a nerve, and a nerve that goes back through the, the spine, back up to, to the brain, and we're going to call this brain the Godhead. So everything that is represented in those seven feasts of Israel, every part of those is a reflection of what was designed by God's big program and God's big plan for mankind. Just as we've talked about the Passover and we've talked about the unleavened bread and now then we talk about the feast of the first fruits. Well, the interesting thing is that as Jesus rose from the tomb, and I've got it there on the calendar. We're going to may come back to that. Well, I've just did what I didn't want to do. And I can't see that up there for the glare of the lights. I'm sorry. It shows that we're that we're struggling to try to produce this and we're not we're not experts at it yet. Okay, now then, so just forgive us, we're, we're going to get it done. The feast of the Passover encompasses normally all three of these first fruits. We just, uh, by rote, call it the feast of the Passover. Uh, the feast of first fruits right here where Jesus rose from the tomb. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that, but I will tell you this, that Jesus was crucified on a Wednesday. He was put into the tomb about sundown, which would have made it the beginning of the following day. So Jesus was crucified about sundown, or, or he was actually crucified. He died about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon in about an hour's window. But he was taken down, and they hurriedly got permission to take his body by his uncle Joseph of Arimathea, was his great uncle, and one of the wealthiest men in all of Israel. He was a tin merchant, and he was Jesus' great uncle. And, and Joseph went and begged the body of Jesus. They got him hurriedly ready, just prepared as quickly as they could to be able to put him in the tomb because he had to be in the tomb 
before sundown or by sundown because it was what we call a high Sabbath. And that high Sabbath was not the normal weekly Sabbath, but it was a high Sabbath where they were not to work or do any, any work and certainly not uh, prepare a body and bury it. So it had to be done before sundown because the, the, the 15th, which began at sundown on that day, was the first day of the unleavened bread. So he was placed in the tomb right as the day of unleavened bread began. And so it would have been one day, two days, and three days. If he was in the tomb three days and three nights, as the Bible said, he had to come out of that tomb at about sundown. On the third day, which would have been, now sun, Now Saturday was their Sabbath. Understand that. It's confusing to some folks because we've always accounted it. You know, it was changed way back when. As I, someday we're going to get into that. But that Saturday was their Sabbath. And so Jesus rose from the tomb about sundown on the third day, just as it was starting to get, get sundown and the dark was coming in on the 17th which was the day of the first fruits. So Jesus fulfilled all three of these very first um, the very first of these uh, uh, seven uh, these seven uh, uh, feasts I'll get it out in a minute uh, he fulfilled the first three of them right there, bam, bam, bam. But they were three different, distinctive, having distinctive meanings. And we could spend hours, I could spend days talking about all three of these. But for brevity, and I'm just trying to get the, just the point over to you that it is just simply a big, 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 big story. It's just the story of your Bible. And uh, from, from, as we used to say in Oklahoma, from hill to stern, it's just the story of your Bible. And it is all embodied within uh, the, uh, the, the, the framework of this, uh, these seven feasts of Israel. Now then, there was a one more feast then that was to be observed. And of course, that was the feast of, of, uh, of Pass of not pa of uh, Pentecost, and the feast of Pentecost was the very next feast on the on the. Uh, I've done it again. I thought this was a good idea moving over to this side of the board. Problem is, is that it? Yeah. The problem is I got a light just above me that's reflecting on that right there in that area and I can't see anything but the reflection of that light. But, uh, uh, okay, he said in the Law of Moses, the 23rd chapter of the book of Leviticus, he tells us that to number seven Sabbaths, to number seven Sabbaths, from the day of the first fruits. That would have been the day that Jesus rose from the tomb to count, and that was a Sabbath. And to count seven Sabbaths, which would have been what? 49 days. And then on, he told Moses, tell the people that on the morrow after the 49th day, after the seventh Sabbath, that would have been the next day. Then that is to be designated as the Feast of Pentecost. Now, Talking about what does the Feast of Pentecost represent. The word Pentecost is just a Greek word. It was actually in biblical times in the Old Testament called the Feast of the Harvest. That was because the harvest was, was getting, uh, the first early harvest was pretty well being completed at this time. And they call that the Feast of the Harvest. Or some of them call it in some places it's mentioned as the Feast of Weeks. Uh, the Greek translation of that was just at Pentecost, which means 50, the Feast of 50. But the significance of it is that when the children of Israel left Egypt on the 14th of Nisan, and they began the journey to Mount Sinai over in uh, the, the land of Sinai and into the mountain at Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, into that area where God intended to give them the instructions that he ultimately gave them that after they had traveled and they arrived at Mount Sinai on the 47th day uh, after they had left 
on the 14th day of Nisan, 47 days later, they were there at Mount Sinai, and God spoke to Moses and said, you tell the people to go and take baths and clean up and refresh themselves and to rest, for on the third day from now, three days from now, I am going to give to them the law and the instructions for their living and for their life and for their nation and the things that they are to observe throughout all of the of, of time. And that 50 days, that was 50 days, 47 plus 3, 50 days. So it was in remembrance of the God giving the law on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law as God wrote it out and gave it to Moses. And you've got that all through the, the book of, uh, of Deuteronomy and, and uh, also through the book of the Leviticus particular, uh, the Leviticus and Deuteron- Deuteronomy and, and some of the numbers, the book of Numbers tells of, of the story. But this all has reference to God giving the law, God changing things, God being in charge. And this is what Pentecost is all about, is God coming down. They didn't go up on the mountain, understand. God came down uh, to the people and he delivered to them the Ten Commandments and the law. The, The Ten Commandments is the backbone of the law, just as the feast of the Trump, or the feast of the, of Israel is the backbone of the entire law of God. So our Bible is built around these feasts. Completely around. Feast of Pentecost then is the time when, and we're going to probably deal, spend a lot of time on this next week, on the Feast of Pentecost, because that is the time of the birthday of the church. God's day, God's time, and the birthday of the church came on the day of Pentecost, on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So those four feasts then were fulfilled right there during the the period following the uh, life and death of Jesus Christ, the Feast of Pentecost, when we were going to talk about the upper room experience and what happened and what it meant and so forth. I would like to throw another little goodie in before we close today. And this is something that most of of the world, again, I don't know how I keep coming up with this. I was... Never taught it is growing up in church. I had never heard a preacher talk about it. I never once remember a preacher explaining these things or even teachers explaining these things that are so pertinent to the understanding of the Bible. That's the reason why we have uh, umpteen dozen, hundreds and thousands of different denominations, people believing this, and some believes that, and something, one guy thinks this, another thinks something else, and all the confusion is because that they, they nitpick the scriptures, they'll find one little sliver of scripture, and they'll take that sliver of scripture, and they'll make a whole denominational belief structure out of it. And that's absolutely obtuse. If they understood the backbone of the Bible, if they understood the, these feasts and, and their relevance to what they're meaning and what they're teaching, they can understand what the Bible is talking about. The Bible fills in. It's all the fill in around the backbone structure of the Word of God. So then, just as importantly, that leaves, I'm going to talk about this a lot more, but I'm going to just jump ahead enough to say that the Feast of Pentecost on the, on the, was the birthday of the church. There's a, a space of time between the Feast of Pentecost and the Feast of Trumpets. There's not been any more of these feasts that have been fulfilled, but there's three of them that is left yet to be fulfilled. And you and I are living examples of what's going on right now. The Feast of the Trumpets is getting ready to happen. I can tell you when uh, the, the Bible uh, signs, the times. What, and, and we're living today. 
Just as I said earlier, the prophetic end time scenario is no longer going to happen because that scenario that leads up to this time, which is the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is going to occur at the Feast of the Trumpets. And that, you know, that may, that may seem negative to some people. But there's nothing negative about it. Jesus said, and when you see these signs begin to come to pass, to look up and rejoice, for your redemption draweth nigh. We should be happy. We should be excited. We understand that we're going to be going through some things. As I said, I already said before in, in, in other uh, sessions, that we're going to go through some things. That the good times, I think that the good times is about over as far as the things that we're experiencing. We have reached the very zenith or the summit of the period of time of the good times. And I know that there are those that are teaching that there's going to be a great revival come. You know, I hope, man, I pray, I would wish that there would be a great revival. But I believe that that period of time has came and gone. I think that what we are looking at right now and is staring us in the face, the period of time when Jesus is getting ready to come and catch his bride. This world, if you think it's getting better, you need to wake up from your dream because the world is becoming more and more wicked every day and Satan knows his time is short and Satan is working with everything that he has, every power within his arsenal every era in his arsenal to detract and to destroy before Jesus comes. He's coming soon. Look up. Wake up. Get your eyes on him. Get your heart in prayer. Get yourself ready to go. And may God richly bless you and thank you for your time. And we hope to see you soon. God bless your hearts. Thank you.